we leave week four in Rhode Island with four teams with at least three wins and four teams all with one win trying to get into that middle of the pack and even maybe farther here at the halfway point of the summer 2024 season. I'm Joey Zaka. We're going to get to the post-game show in a second here for week four, and we're going to break down all those week four games, look ahead to week five, and then talk about some of our favorites for the It's Possible Basketball Most Valuable Player Award for this season. We have a sponsor. The winners will be getting some cool stuff in addition to being named the regular season most valuable player. Uh, like I said, this is the week four post-game show. Because of the holiday, happy fourth, everybody. I am alone, so you guys get a, uh, a lot of me today breaking down the week four games, and, and it's a good thing, I think. Usually, I'm in host mode, kind of handing out some assists, just like I do on the court. Lots of assists, you know, setting up the analysts, kind of hearing their opinions. Well, today you get my opinion on the games, which, of course, everyone is always dying uh, to know you know, exactly just what I think. So let's get to week four, which, again, had an overtime game and really allowed us to see some separation, I think, between the different tiers of teams. And so I'll, I'll do some tiers, too, if I remember at the end of this. We can kind of put some, some tiers together, tier one, tier two, tier three, uh, for the teams, and, and even if we just do the top three tiers. Because I think there really is some separation, and that's what the regular season allows. It allows to kind of see different matchups, see how teams do week to week, and then as, as Lob City has said, having won this many times, things change in the playoffs, and I have said that as well. It's a whole different game in the playoffs. Players play different for obvious reasons. You know, in a, in a one-and-done scenario, there's no time to mess around, where in the regular season, not that we mess around, but, you know, it's, it's different. It's just different. Let's get to that overtime game to kick off uh, the week four postgame show. It was our last game of week four and was one of the best. All right, so like I said, the, the lone overtime game was all talk sports and Providence defense. It was Providence defense getting the win 67 to 60. Uh, they, you know, throughout this game really tried to pull away many times, would get it up to seven, eight points, and it was all talk sports playing their second game in two nights coming back and, and always erasing that deficit. Sometimes then they would take the lead, and it was just a really back-and-forth game. So let me get this, uh, this box score up here for you guys. But again, it is Providence defense getting the, the win, and, and that improves them to uh, – there we go. This is the right one. That improves them to 2-2 two and two on the season. All talk sports after winning Monday night. We'll get to that in, in their first game of Week 4, fall on Tuesday night as they fall to 1-3. and three. But as you can see here, uh, Thomas DeAndrea, 19 points, 11 rebounds, and three threes for one of their, their bigger post players. Gianluca Bacchini with uh, 14 and 13. So he, he made some really big buckets. And All Talk had an opportunity at the end of regulation, I'm pretty sure, to get a, you know, to win the game. Uh, they had like an awkward... 12-footer from the baseline. It was in that last possession, the final seconds, and somebody was just kind of open uh, on the baseline, and it's, one, it's that hard shot from the short corner. They miss it, uh, and, and we end up going to overtime where Providence defense does get the win. Jesus Thames with 21 and 11. He was really that energy, and I feel like any time he drove to the basket, he was able to get there, to get all the way to the hoop. And so... That's something where I think some of the perimeter defense for all talk sports really wasn't at its best. And that then puts the pressure on the back of your defense. And as you can see, there, I don't even know the foul numbers, but 16 to 19, you know, all talk sports fouled, fouled more. Um, and you can see both teams shot 16 free throws. So some of those may have been on the perimeter trying to stop Providence defense from getting to the hoop. Um, but just more fouls, and nobody really in foul trouble, but just more um, fouls and, and plays at the rim that Providence defense was able to uh, capitalize on. And uh, Jacob Darber, 13 and 11 as well. They only had five or six guys, Providence defense. All talk sports had seven, eight, seven guys. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, this game, you know, really said a lot, I think, about Providence defense. They've kind of been up and down, and let me kind of get to their schedule really quick. They started off week one losing to the Owl Waves, beating the Muffin Tops in week two, 
Providence defense falls to the Skyhawks in week three and then gets back on track in week four. So really just, you know, the definition almost of a 500 team to this point. Now that doesn't mean things aren't going to change as they get velocity. The washed up boys, which would be a great game in week six, one of our two undefeated teams. They then get the game breakers, one of our two three and one teams, and they close out the season with Lob City, the other undefeated team. So the way I look at it for Providence defense, and then we'll get to all talk quickly, it's almost like they've missed some opportunities because the back end of their schedule gets really tough. We just said it, Game Breakers, Lob City, um, Washed Up Boys, the top three teams in our power rankings as of right now. So to be 2-2 two and two with those games not yet being played means they might finish under 500. Now, in the playoffs, that will set up for one of those matchups where whether it's um, 6 versus 11, um, 7 versus 10, where it's two teams that are close, and that's going to make for a great playoff game. Uh, and then, you know, c- to continue down the road in the playoffs is a whole different, different beast, but you get some momentum, and, and who knows. As for All Talk Sports, let's kind of recap their schedule here at the halfway point. Um, they lost to Lob City, so they've already played kind of one of those higher teams, but they're also one and three. Uh, they then lost to the Washed Up Boys by four in a close game in week two. They didn't play last week. We're going to get to how they took down Velocity and fell to Providence defense. They will then get the halfway crooks in week five, uh, who are also coming off a loss. This loss. The Skyhawks in week six. Uh, Muffin Tops in Week 7, and All Waves in Week 8. So All Talk still has some work to do, but it feels like some of those games are going to really show us what direction they're going to go in uh, as well. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, the other, you know, I just mentioned the All Waves, another highly anticipated game uh, that finished a six-point margin was the Air Mambas uh, getting their second win, uh, handing the All Waves their third loss. Like I talked about, the Air Mambas get the win, 86-80, and uh, 34-23 to in that fourth quarter. So I did the interview after the game with Nick LeMoyne and Aiden uh, Dozos, and they were saying you know, it was all about communication, and they were making shots today, 13-36 to from three for the Air Mambas. It was a, a, I said it in the, in the interview, what happened in that fourth quarter? And it's funny, that's like the second week in a row for the All Waves, um, yeah, second week in a row because they almost did it to the halfway crooks in week three where in that fourth quarter, they, they look like a different team. And if only they can do that from the opening jump, they, they might you know, be three and one, two and two. Instead, they're looking at one and three and we'll kind of get to their future you know, games coming up in a second. But the always in that fourth quarter are a team that we expect them to be and they were without you know, Jawan Gamble, who had a huge game in week three, Nick Montanino, who hit some of those threes in that fourth quarter of game three. Instead, it was Josh Chapina for the All Waves, 37 points and 10 rebounds, four of 15 from three. So, you know, Michael Labonte kind of picked it up there, three of four from three, and was the two of them hit some threes in that fourth quarter to really make this game interesting. And they were within one possession. Uh, with about three or four minutes to go in that fourth quarter. The Air Mambas, 34 points from Nick LeMoyne and six rebounds. Aiden Dozos, 28 and nine. Uh, Both of them made over four threes for the Air Mambas. And the Air Mambas shot 36% from three and to just 30% for the All Waves. But, you know, rebounding was even. Um, Turnovers were essentially even. The Air Mambas were just able to control the game and hit more shots in that first, the first quarter for sure. In the second quarter, they had a double-digit lead at halftime. They built on that lead going into the third quarter, and like I said, just totally flipped in that fourth quarter. You know, Terrence, it, it was a lineup of, and I just want to get it right, Josh DePina, Terrence Gallo, Jake Ashstetter, and Michael Labonte. Michael, Michael Labonte was huge, 15 points for him, like I said, and so those four were the top four scorers, but it was that lineup. They, you know, Corey Strickland came in and out and made some plays, but it was that four that they almost had to ride that entire fourth quarter to flip the momentum. Uh, And so it's always interesting to kind of see how a team like that where, you know, can we do that the full game? 
please. <laughs> like, why can't we do that from the opening jump? We'll see next week. They better do it from the opening jump because the All Waves get Lob City uh, as the last game of Week 5. So um, that Tuesday night in Week 5 is awesome. We'll, we'll get to the full schedule in a second. But to close out Week 5, All Waves and Lob City. And so you can't, you know, it will not be the same situation for the All Waves as the past two weeks where if they hang around, and I'm even using that loosely because they look dead in, in the first three quarters in, in Week 4. They can't do that in week five and be like, oh, we'll try it again in the fourth quarter. Like, that's obviously not the plan. But against Lob City, that is definitely not the best recipe to, to get a win uh, for the All Waves. In week six, they get the Muffin Tops. In week seven, they get the Washed Up Boys, who are rolling right now. And then all talk sports to close out the season. So they're in a similar position of, as Providence defense, where some of their harder games are still to come here. And they're one and three at the halfway point for the All Waves. As for the Air Mambas, they're two and two. They, you know, <laughs> they, as in Mario, uh, Mario Valerio, kind of constantly talking about the week two game against Lob City, and rightfully so. That was a great game, an overtime game, a one point loss for the Air Mambas, but, you know, things don't just go differently against Lob City. You have to do a lot to make a different result in that game. But if something flips, they're three and one. Like that's how close they were to being three and one. Uh, and their future schedule quickly. The Air Mambas get the Road Dogs in Week Five, who are also uh, one and three. So currently below them in the standings. It is then Velocity in Week Six for the Air Mambas. They then get the Halfway Crooks in Week Seven. And the game breakers in week eight. So two and two, they split them at the halfway point. They have some, you know, again, some of those higher uh, teams in the power rankings and the standings coming up to close out the season. So we're going to learn a lot about every team. Duh, they're going to play four more games. But especially some of the teams I just mentioned that are two and two, one and three. Can they turn it around? Can they steal a win Let's use my team so that nobody gets mad at me. Can they steal a win against the halfway crooks that maybe people didn't expect and then you know, take care of business against some of the other teams they expect to beat and finish 5-3 and three and kind of be in the conversation for that four seed and that bye in the playoffs because the top four seeds will get a bye to the quarterfinals with 12 teams this summer. So every team makes the playoffs. That's really what you're battling for. Because if not, you're playing in the first round anyway. And then, of course, you want a better matchup. But every team makes the playoffs. And at some point, you're going to have to play a good team. So the matchups matter, but not as much. But a big win for the you know, Air Mambas to bounce back after week three against the Skyhawks. They, that was the game they severely struggled shooting. Um, I'm not even going to look at the box score because it, it hurts. I, I believe it was two or three threes in that game, in the entire game for the Air Mambas. Um, so they, they bounce back. They make more threes. They look like a version of the team that we saw against Lob City and get the win. And that's the ultimate goal, to get them back to 2-2. Two and two. Uh, Let's get to, speaking of that close game for the Air Mambas against Lob City, let's get to Lob City in Week 4, who improved to 4-0. Lob City with a 19-point win, uh, a big first quarter, so the exact opposite of what the All Waves do at Lob City Staple. They come out and get a lead on you early and then really keep the pressure on you. A 75-56 win over the Road Dogs as the Road Dogs fall to 1-3 and three like we talked about. For Lob City, Joe Secator, 35 points uh, and 10 rebounds. Nuri Mahmood, 14-7. and seven. And Sweeney with 11 uh, and 7 as well. Um, a quiet game from Almar Sabat, who was awesome, and, and still you could still tell he was out there. It's, it's one of my things where it's like, did he get off the bus today? And that's not what I'm saying at all about him. Um, just not as many points as I, as I expect now, kind of from, from him. Um, but it's not always about scoring, which you will figure out in this league. You can impact the game. It's like real basketball. You can impact the game in more than one way, and it's not just getting 30 and kind of having some empty stats. Um, he had some huge blocks, Almar did. Uh, was playing defense, especially on the perimeter, and uh, made life difficult for the Road Dogs, who do fall to 1-3. and three. Del Butler led the way with 24-9. and nine. So that was kind of one of the advantages, I think, was noticeable from the beginning. And 
I'm not sure how the Road Dogs could have attacked that more. I think they did a good job of that. I think it was just not making enough outside shots when they were attacking down low. Uh, Karan Bostic with nine, Shaq Arju with eight. And as a team for the Road Dogs, three of 20 from three. You know, it sounds like they, you know, the Air Mamba stuff rubbed off on them, uh, like I talked about. But three of 20 from three when Lob City is not giving you the threes, but they had some looks. Of course, you want to make every shot. Making more of those is like number one in your checklist of how to kind of hang with Lob City. You got to make threes to at least kind of stretch their defense. They attacked a mismatch down low. I like it. 24 and 9. Uh, for for Dell Butler, I mean, I think that was a an advantage they had, and like I said, they attacked it. Lob City was just able to overcome it. Um, they made seven threes. Lob City did six of them by Joe Secator, who got hot, and so just kind of dagger after dagger after dagger for Lob City, and uh, Joe Secator led the way with that. Anytime Lob City needed a bucket to kind of take momentum back, um, that's what happened, and it really never got close. After that, after that first quarter, it was never, you know, they, the Road Dogs were able to cut into that lead, but never really get it to under a three possession game um, at any point in this game. And so kind of a, a, you know, repeat of what happened over the winter where Lob City and the Road Dogs, two of these teams that have talent, have, you know, Road Dogs second season, you know, look good on certain, you know, situations against certain teams, and then they face off in Lob City just likes to remind everybody, you know, we're Lob City. Uh, you gotta, you gotta always bring it when you play Lob City. So, like I said, Lob City four and zero. The Road Dogs fall to one and three. Let's start with the Road Dogs first. We talked about it. They get the Air Mambas in week five. So, you know, the Air Mambas are, are two and two. The Road Dogs are one and three. If the Road Dogs win, both of those teams would be two and three, and then the Road Dogs would have the tiebreaker, winning head to head in that scenario. That that would put the Road Dogs right back in the middle of everything. Losing that game in 1-4 and four is very different uh, for the Road Dogs because in Week 6, they get the Game Breakers, so another tough opponent. The Road Dogs in Week 7 get the Skyhawks, and then to close out the season, they get the Muffin Top. So their next three games are against three um, tough teams that, that they will need to kind of figure some stuff out and get that chemistry going um, to to right the ship, to turn things around. As for Lob City in Week 5, they get the All Waves. We talked about that a little bit already. They get the Halfway Crooks, a finals rematch in Week 6. Lob City gets Velocity and then Providence Defense in Week 8. So, sure, there's a lot of teams that I'm like, oh, that's going to be a good matchup. That's going to be a good matchup. Lob City's right where they expect to be. Very well could run the table, but they do have some, you know, Cody was saying it, this is the stretch. This is the... You know, the all waves they know have talent and they have to come ready, you know, to take care of business. The halfway crooks they know they got to come ready and, and to, just to take care of business. And then week seven and eight to kind of get ready for the playoffs and keep that momentum going for Lob City. Before no, exactly where they expect to be. And uh, yeah, they, the two undefeated teams will not play. Uh, and so um, we could finish with two undefeated teams that did not play, where in that situation it would be point differential. Uh, to figure out, you know, who gets the top seed versus the two seed. They'd be on opposite sides of the bracket anyway. Um, so not the biggest thing to worry about. But our next game, speaking of the halfway crooks, um, they fell to the game breakers. And of course, of course, I have some opinions on that one. All right, the game breakers get their third win in a battle of two and one teams coming in 93-78. A huge fourth quarter for the Game Breakers. It was a close game. Both teams going back and forth. And really, the Game Breakers, it doesn't say how many threes they made in the fourth quarter. They made 21 in the game. I know Jose Mercado by himself had three or four in the fourth quarter. I can picture Hachi, uh, Hachi Amini, I think from the other corner or from one of the corners, making a three in the fourth quarter. So that's 15 points for sure right there from behind the three-point line for the Game Breakers. A huge reason, and it was really early in the fourth quarter, but they just went on a run, didn't miss the game breakers uh, from three. It seemed like I'm back to back to back to back possessions and just kind of blew it open after what was a 
you know, three-point game at halftime, and then the halfway crooks had a lead going into the fourth quarter. Um, and then quickly, quickly, it was a double-digit lead in that fourth quarter with about six or seven minutes to go for the game breakers, and uh, they, the halfway crooks struggled to score, and the game breakers get the win. So um, I'll get to some of the analysis in a second, but Charles Correa, 22 points and eight rebounds. Dom Langston, 21, and he made five threes, which is another dimension to the halfway crooks when Dom Langston, with all that he does, is able to also hit a couple outside shots. It stretches that defense like we talked about for previous games. Jeff, Jeff Winchell, 14 and nine. Uh, and four, then the game breakers, Gian Abedijan, 32 and 12, Hachi Amini, 29 and 10, uh, and Jose Mercado, 23 and 13. Uh, so, yeah, the, you know, we can, math is hard, but a lot of points combined between those three, um, and they were, they were effective. They were rolling. Um, pretty good field goal percentages for the three of them. They all shot over 43%. All three of them shot over 38% from three. 15 threes for Gian and Hachi combined. And they took 50. So even just looking at some of the other games, that one doesn't count. You know, velocity will get there. They took 27 in a game. That was a little more of a blowout. But the Game Breakers took 50. So nearly double. um, Well, that's not right. Double some teams, but by far more threes than a lot of other teams normally take. Um... If not double, that's that's fair, but it's not always double. So a ton of threes. It felt like not settling, but that was definitely what was open. And they were comfortable. Hey, we're going to take them. We're going to hit them at some point, And that's how we're going to win this game. And we're cool with that. Because the, the game breakers added Charles Alexander and Jose Mercado, which helped them be bigger. No David DePina, who does a lot for that team in this game. But they added players who can protect the rim, rebound, play down low, defend bigger players. So they had some matchups they can rely on. They, they, not that they didn't drive because they did, they were trying to get out in transition and they were taking the threes when they were there. And like I said, in that fourth quarter, they were able to keep it close, um, you know, shooting under 40% before the fourth quarter and then got hot in the fourth quarter and, and pulled away. So their game plan, they stuck to it. It was definitely, let's take the threes that they're giving us the halfway crooks being in his own, uh, and it worked. You know, it, it, it ultimately worked. They also out-rebounded the halfway crooks, so talking about all that size, you know, I think a lot of that, it felt even. It felt even, the, the rebounding, you know, 13 offensive rebounds for the halfway crooks, 12 for the game breakers. It felt even. I think that fourth quarter when the halfway crooks struggled to score, that allowed for a lot of more, a, a lot more defensive rebounds in that situation for the game breakers just because the halfway crooks weren't scoring as much, um, which then gives them the edge there. So it felt even in that regard, and even turnovers, 9-9, nine to nine, exactly even. So, um, yeah, back last summer, this was the matchup that I think it was just two very different styles for these two teams. The halfway crooks with some bigger players and some size and were able to go even bigger last year than they can this year. And the game breakers didn't have those bigger players, so it was going small, they would still rebound extremely well, but they didn't have the size to easily rebound, to easily get that advantage. They had to really work. And the Game Breakers won the matchup last summer as well, using that speed, hitting those outside shots, taking advantage of what they had an advantage in, which was size, well, sorry, which was speed, and um, you know, hitting the outside shots and, and sharing the ball. And that's what they did here this summer in this matchup in week four. So really quick, I know we're already, this is the longest podcast ever. The halfway crooks get all talk sports in week five, Lob City like we talked about in week six, Air Mambas in week seven, and Velocity in week eight. So the halfway crooks at two and two still have some work to do. The Game Breakers get the Washed Up Boys in week five, one of those matchups against, you know, Washed Up Boys are undefeated. That's going to be an awesome game, so I'm very excited to see that one. Week 6, Game Breakers Road Dogs, another game that will be one to see. Game Breakers Providence Defense in Week 7, and then Game Breakers and Air Mambas in Week 8. So those are four matchups where, would I be shocked if the Game Breakers won them all? No. Uh, Would I be shocked if the Game Breakers went 2-2? and A little more than if they went undefeated, but not shocked either. I think that's the, 
that's the, the window. And they're, they're a good team. Uh, they're going to make a run in the playoffs. They have the experience. There's just some different matchups in there uh, for them, uh, which is going to be interesting to kind of see how they're able to play against some of these different teams. Um, let's continue on. All Talk Sports played two games in week four after missing out in week three, and they nearly, well, they did. They did double up velocity in week four. All right, it is All Talk Sports, 112 to 60. They jump out with a 20-point lead in the first quarter and never look back. Justin Bianchi in this one, 30 points, 12 rebounds. Gianluca, 21 and 8. Thomas D'Andrea, 21 and 20 in this one. So a huge game for those three for All Talk Sports. Ashton Alcock led the way for Velocity, 23 and 4. And Lance McKenzie had 19 himself. But again, this one was out of control early. Uh, just all All Talk Sports, they were hitting their shots. Um, only took seven threes and made four of them. So really just having their way inside, getting to the rim, getting whatever they wanted. It was really fast paced as well. And once it gets out of, out of hand like that, both teams are kind of more accepting of less defense, if, if that's the best way to put that. Um, but yeah, and uh, 10 to 27 from three for velocity. So we already talked about, you know, all talk sports and there's not, you know, just a, a tough matchup for velocity in week four in that one. Let's kind of take a look at the rest of Velocity's schedule. Providence defense in week five. The Air Mambas in week six. Lob City, the champs, in week seven. And the halfway crooks for Velocity in week eight. So some of those teams ahead of them for sure in the standings. We'll see if they can steal one. And for all talk sports, did we already do this? Yeah, halfway crooks. Skyhawks, we already did that for them because they played already. So, you know, all talk, one and three. Velocity also at one and three. So both of those teams, uh, you know, battling it out there. And uh, only because All Talk already played, we already broke them down. Let's get to the last game uh, that we're talking about here from week four is the Washed Up Boys Take Care of Business against the Muffin Tops. It is the Washed Up Boys, 74 48, getting the win, improving to 4 0. Led by Kevin Gonzalez is 27 and 7. Leroy Brown with 21 and 19 uh, for the Washed Up Boys. The Muffin Tops, Frank Smith with 21 and 10. Michael Berto, 12. And Tim Hayes with 11 and 11. Uh, you know, a, a four point game after the first quarter. The Washed Up Boys, you know, with only four guys initially. Uh, and then, you know, eventually got their fifth player uh, in the game and, and ready to go. But um, not the most you know, intense defense initially from the washed up boys, and they were still able to hold them up in tops of 48 points and, and get the win on this one. So, um, yeah, I, I think the washed up boys through four weeks, you know, Hendel LaRoll has been a huge part, so he's missed two of their games, and they've still been able to win both of those. He adds a lot of offense. Leroy Brown uh, is huge, and, and his ability to get to the hoop, he hit three threes in this game and attack the basket and protect the rim. He's a big part of them. And if Kevin Gonzalez can, can keep this up, uh, 12 and 19 shooting, 27 points, really, really good all-around game for him. If he can be that third piece with then Jeremy Eltume hitting some threes, Moisey Rainford hitting some threes, Abby Bemgos hitting some threes, I think that's where then this team has the pieces and the, and the different types of players to really compete. And we're going to see, and we already talked about it. So for the Washed Up Boys, next week they get the Game Breakers. So hopefully handle the role there for that one. Uh, that'll be an awesome game. The Washed Up Boys then get Providence Defense, the All Waves, and then they end with the Skyhawks. So some different types of teams there. And for the Muffin Tops, they get the Skyhawks in Week 5, the All Waves in Week 6, All Talk in Week 7, and the Road Dogs to close out the season. We'll see if they can get their first win uh, in one of those games. As promised, let's kind of do some tiers here. So, so give me one second, and then we're going we're gonna to put some of these teams in some tiers kind of based on some different things they've done here at the halfway point in the season. All right, we're back, and looking at the standings here, so... I think Lob City being in a tier of their own is only right. 
until someone beats them, until someone beats them in the playoffs. But Lob City being in a tier of their own, tier one, Lob City, the champs, that's what I would have so far at 4 0. Tier two, I think, is two teams, and the Skyhawks might be mad at me for this, but I think it's the Game Breakers and the Washed Up Boys. And I'll be unbiased with the halfway crooks, but I think that's tier two right now. Game Breakers and the Washed Up Boys, those teams will play. We talked about it, I believe it's this week. Awesome. So we get to see two tier two teams, according to my made-up tiers, go at it in week five. But I think those two teams have separated themselves from the other nine, and they've, they've earned it. Uh, one being undefeated, the Game Breakers, their only loss to Lob City. If um yeah, in, in week three by four points. So nearly all of them, you know, undefeated um, at this point. So tier one, Lob City, tier two, Game Breakers and the Washed Up Boys. Tier three is definitely the Skyhawks, the Halfway Crooks. I think that's tier three. And Providence Defense is probably like, what the heck? The Air Mambos are probably like, what the heck? The Road Dogs should be in that conversation, but they haven't earned it, to be fair. And I've always been like, they have the talent, they have the talent, which they do. They're one and three. So until they can make some of these games, you know, be a win instead of a loss, and they've had two close losses in weeks two and three, very close losses, it's a loss. And I I hate to do it, but yeah. So I think Tier 3, Halfway Crooks, and the Skyhawks. And the Skyhawks with two big wins, um, even just their schedule previously, they fell to the Game Breakers as their lone loss in their first game and have since beaten the All Waves. I know we talked about this, the Air Mambas, as well as Providence Defense. So they've played some of the teams we're talking about. They're in Tier 3. For them to get to Tier 2, they'd have to beat one of the teams ahead of them, and I hate saying something so simple. But they're currently in Tier 3 with the Halfway Crooks, whose two losses are to the Washed Up Boys in Week 1, who are undefeated, and that was a close game again to the fourth quarter, and to the Game Breakers. So they'll have some games to kind of maybe make up some ground. They have Lob City coming up, the Halfway Crooks do, like we talked about, but Putting them in Tier 3, even though they're 2-2, two and two, I think, makes sense. And I'll go to Tier 4, and then I'll kind of leave out the rest of the teams. But Tier 4, and I'll recap kind of everything, Tier 4 would be Providence Defense, the Air Mambas, the Road Dogs, who I all think are right there, and, I, and I'll, I'll include the All Waves, but God, that's a tough one. And I can't do all talk sports yet, even though they were right there with Providence defense. Need to see more from them. So my tier four is Providence defense, Air Mambas, Road Dogs, All Waves. And so it's nine teams in four tiers. Yeah, I think I think those four are all anybody could be any anybody on any week on any game night. So tier one, Lob City. Just to recap, tier two. Washed Up Boys and Game Breakers. Tier 3, Skyhawks and Halfway Crooks. Tier 4, Providence Defense, Air Mambas, Road Dogs, All Waves. Those are the tiers at the halfway point of the summer 2024 season. As promised, let's do some MVP talk. It's the It's Possible Basketball Most Valuable Player Award for the summer 2024 season. Uh, let's kind of mention some players here. It's something I kind of want to keep an eye on throughout the season, especially when the interns come back next week, our intern analysts, and I think getting their opinion on who they would have is most valuable because it's always the discussion that we have. Is it the best player? Is it the person who scores the most points? I don't go that way, but some people do. Is it the person who's the most valuable to helping their team win? Does it have to come from the top two seeds, the top three seeds? We've had kind of all different variations of that. And so it depends on really your opinion of what valuable means. 
it can be different than who you think should win the most valuable player award, even though the word valuable is in MVP. So uh, last season, uh, and I'm probably going to get it wrong, but I know Joe Secator was our finals MVP, and I can tell you really quick, I believe, yeah, also regular season MVP and our finals MVP from the winter 2024 season, Joe Secator. And it's only fitting to start off with him, I think, still as the front runner as Lob City is um, you know, 4-0. Uh, he's one of the main reasons they're 4-0. He is averaging 27.5 points a game, shooting nearly 30% from three, 5.8 rebounds a game, uh, and 3.3 assists. So doing a little bit of everything, really, really leading the way for Lob City, similarly to what he did last season, and picked up right where he left off through the first four games for Lob City. So Joe Secator first. Just going by scoring... I think either, and I'm definitely going to ask this to our analysts next week, the Game Breakers who are 3-1, and one, Hachi Amini averaging 36.3 points a game, Gian Avedesian averaging nearly 28, excuse me, 28 points a game, both of them shooting over 38% from three. They both played in four games. One of, so like they're kind of almost, and it's not right, so there's, thank goodness there's four more games to figure this out, they're almost doing like the KD and Steph on the Warriors thing where like they're almost pulling from each other because they're on the same team. But if you were to take one of them off and put them on their own team with these numbers, like that would make, that would put them in this conversation. So it's like, I'm not putting anybody in order either, but like one A and one B, if we're talking about the game breakers, most valuable player, it's Gian or Hachi. And I can't even pick right now. I think that'll become more clear when the Game Breakers play the teams we talked about. But they both do so much for this team uh, on both ends. And so I think that's super important to talk about. The other one where the Washed Up Boys, that's where it gets interesting. So that team is 4-0 and Hendel LaRoe played in two games and is averaging 33 points a game. So, I mean, they're 2-0 with him. They're 2-0 without him. I think just on stats, he makes an interesting case. And the impact, I think value, he takes the washed up boys to another level. Leroy Brown, you've been awesome. Kevin Gonzalez, you had a great game in week four and have been consistent. Leroy Brown, nearly 17 points, 14 rebounds, um, and four assists a game. 60% shooting from the floor for him for, for Leroy Brown. So he's been great. He has a case. Like I'm a huge, I'm, I'm very valuable to this team and I agree. Handle a role in those bigger games. We saw it in that game against the Road Dogs. He was the best player on that team that day. Doesn't mean he is all the time. There's still four games left. I like to hedge myself, but Handle a role currently would be my pick from the Washed Up Boys to add into this category for the It's Possible Basketball Most Valuable Player. And then that's where it kind of gets a little interesting because the Skyhawks are also 3-1, and one, just to kind of go over some of the top teams and not that it's all about record, but that's usually where this conversation starts. Value to me in some form equates to wins. And so for the Skyhawks to be 3-1, and one, Noah James I think should be in this conversation. He's shooting 52% from three right now, and he's taken 35 of them, so it's not like he took four. So he's shooting lights out from three. This team goes really as he goes. Omar Rahman's been great, 18 points, um, nearly a little over eight rebounds for him. He's been awesome, but it's been Noah James and 5.8 assists for him as well. Really, he's averaging 7.8 rebounds a game. Jeez, all right. So doing everything for this team, leading them to three and one. Now when they play some of these other teams that we talked about, they're going to they're gonna take him out, and it's nothing against him. Teams will then focus on him to make it way more difficult for him and be like, here, Elijah Morton, you hit your shots. You know, Isaiah Walker, you can have those threes. Knock yourself out. 
we're not letting Noah do this to us and get his 23, 24, 25, 30, which he's gotten in recent games. Not happening. So if you guys want to do it, we're going we're gonna to take him out. We haven't seen that yet. It's coming. That will tell us just a lot about that team um, being a little undersized. I know I say it a lot, but it will matter as the game slows down, just pace-wise in the playoffs. If he's going to shoot 50% from three, that may overcome a lot of those issues from just not being as big as other teams. I want to see a team devote their life to just being like, Noah is not beating us. So if we lose because everyone else hit their shots, we'll shake your hand and it is what it is. That will tell us this team, what this team is in the Skyhawks. But right now they're 3-1 and one, and they're fourth in the league and they deserve to have somebody in this conversation and Noah James has played definitely well enough to be in this conversation. That's four players. Josh Depina has been good. Just a quick shout out, nearly 25 a game, but the All Waves are 1-3. and three. Aiden Dozos and Nick Lemoyne have both been good, and they're both kind of around that 22, 23 points a game. But do, that team is 2-2, two and two, so respect to them. But do they kind of pull at each other a little bit and kind of take away from each other in this valuable conversation? Jacob Darber for Providence Defense, 1-3, and three, but he's been really good. He's been like one of the main players for Providence Defense. Charles Correa, Dom Langston, both have been good for the Crooks who find themselves at 2-2. Two and two. I think that's kind of where the list gets a little scarier. Uh, the Road Dogs, Del Butler, Luis Ramirez, Air Mambas, Jared Hansen's names on the scoring list. So I sorted it by points to kind of start it. That's not what this is all about. But I think the MVP is about value and value to helping your team win. That's where the definition gets a little scary. But just wanted to kind of preview some of those players for the It's Possible Basketball Most Valuable Player Award. I'm going on... 40 minutes here uh, by myself, which is insane. So we're going to wrap this up. That's week four. Looking ahead to week five. Let me pull the schedule really quick, and then I promise I am done. This is longer than I expected. Skyhawks and Muffin Tops kick off week five. Halfway Crooks and All Talk Sports. Uh, Second game on Monday night, and then Velocity and Providence Defense. I talked about it, and I teased it earlier. Tuesday night, July 9th, Road Dogs Air Mambas, two teams, very close in the standings right now, both trying to kind of turn their season around and, and make that jump. Washed Up Boys and Game Breakers, two of our top three teams in our power rankings, and then Lob City and All Waves end week five. Um, the defending champs and All Waves, two of our kind of returning teams square off. So I'm very excited at the halfway point. A lot more to cover throughout the rest of the season in the playoffs because of the depth and the different types of teams. Oh, yeah. It's going to be a good time. So thanks for watching the post-game show. Thanks for hanging out. Hope everyone had a good holiday. We'll see you back for week five. Stay tuned to thelegacyleagues.com for all your stats and standings and everything like that, player pages. We'll have top plays coming out. Uh, Probably by the time you're listening to this, go check social media, our power rankings as always, and uh, more clips and analysis on Instagram, legacy underscore leagues. Thanks for watching.